Hey, I'm Sarah. And I'm Amy. Welcome to United Humans, a podcast that goes into the personal lives of our 6,000 plus volunteer medics and their families. 75 year old male, possible cardiac arrest. My name is Gabby Friedson. I'm Dana. This is Ronnie. And we're a couple. I'm Vicky. United at Sala's only mission is saving lives, and we'll discuss how that doesn't leave room for discrimination against color, race, religion, or sexual orientation. Let's talk about fear, trauma, pain, and connection. Join us. Let's discuss these diverse volunteers from all across the country. Welcome back to United Humans, a podcast where we go into the personal lives of our 6,200 medics at United Hatsala. We've really had an incredible um, medics show up, and I'm so blown away by people's stories and just the incredible emotion that has come through this podcast so far in the last few months. Um, I think, though, that perhaps this might be <laughs> the most difficult one yet, although it hasn't been recorded yet. I can only imagine that this is going to be a difficult episode. Um, coming up is the first year Azkara, your site of the horrible Miron tragedy. Sitting with me right now is Avi Marcus, the head of Department of Everything Medical in United Hatsala, as well as the head of the Psychotrauma Unit, and Kalani Taub, who was, is a medic and was at the Miron um, tragedy as well. And these two guests, thank, first of all, thank you both so much for taking the time out to come and sit with me today. And um, I really just, before we even start, like, our listeners want to know who you are. Let's give some context. So, Avi, can we start with you? Tell us a little about, about who you are, where you live. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon. Avi Marcus, Deputy uh, Director of Medical Division uh, and the head of the Psychotrauma Unit. I'm a paramedic for the last 20 years. Live in Petah Tikva, married to Mirab, have five kids. Been volunteering in United Atala for the last eight years and working in the organization for the last six years. And you don't sound like you're from Israel. I'm, I'm not Israeli. <laughs> I'm um, English, no, the real the real English. No, you're not. You're South African. No, I'm not. No way. Really? This whole time I thought he was South African. Okay, so you took this podcast to know where you were from. Okay, you're British, and so and you, I'm assuming, have been w- with the organization for how many years? Eight years. Okay, I was gonna say ten. And Colony, where are you from? I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I live now in a frat with my husband and three kids. I've been in EMT with Hatsala for two and a half years now, almost three, and been to a wide variety of calls in my time here. Um, in my free time, I also enjoy um, everything sci-fi geeky. <laughs> I do. And I also enjoy CrossFit and powerlifting. Lifting heavy patients. Um, okay, so maybe you could both tell me, we'll start with you, Connie. What What were you... Were you was it planned for a while that you were going to be in Miron on Lago Bohemia? Do you usually go? How did you get there in the first place? Not at all. I have never, ever been to Miron before that wow. evening. Wow, really? And it wasn't anything that ever interested me because I don't like being mm, in okay. crowded <laughs> areas. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is a place I'm going to avoid at all costs. This is something I always said even before I became an EMT. And... Um, then I was an EMT at Keva Rachel during a Chalimei News Yard site, and I saw that as an EMT at a crowded situation, you're not in the middle of the crowd, you're on the side of the crowd. So I'm like, okay, Meron is something I can also do. I can be on the side of the crowd and not in the middle of the crowd. And I'm like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to see what's going on in Meron because everybody's always talking about it. So I'll be in Meron, and I'm like, I still didn't want to be in the crowds, so I signed up to do an ambulance shift that went around to the different parking lots in the area and treated the people there. And we, um, we, we were on shift at the area around surrounding Miron during um, that evening. Got it. And you, were, you went up with other women? You were on a women's ambulance? or No, I was on a, just an ambulance, me and a driver and two other EMTs. And we were going... And what time did you arrive? I arrived um, at about 6 p.m. So when the shifts first started, they're like, oh, do you want to see what Meron is like before <laughs> before you start the shift? So I went up, and oh, my gosh, it was so crowded. I'm like, okay, I was there for five minutes. I took a picture. I'm like, that's enough for me. 
and I went back down. <laughs> I'll admit, I haven't been back in many, many, many years. It's kind of like an experience that you only need to really have once. <laughs> to know what it is, and then it's enough. Yes. That's how I feel about crowded places. I could not agree with you more. And Avi, um, you were, I imagine, one of the heads of the evening and, and all the development that took place there. So I've been going up to Meron for the last six years. Uh, every year, United Atala has uh, a very big uh, operation over there, up at uh, Meron. We usually start uh, a week before uh, organizing all of our equipment, the places, tents, and so on and so forth. So when all the people come up to to Meron de Lagbaomer, we have all the facilities of the, the, the emergency up on the, on, the on the premises. So I'm up there every year, and every year we say it's a big nest, okay, that no one died or no one was crushed up in Meron. And sadly, last year, uh, it happened. So I went up there on the Thursday morning, okay, to organize the stuff, to organize all the tents, to organize all the facilities, so when people come up, everything will be okay. And there was a makeshift um, moked there as well, a dispatch center, correct? Yes, we always have uh, lots of ambulances and uh, ambulance cycles and all the other gear up on the on there. We have uh, the moked, okay, we have them up there. Uh, helping at all times between 30 to 50 medics and paramedics up over there at Meron in order to assist and help. Every year we treat between 200 to 300 people in the 24 to 30 hours of uh, this whole uh, celebration of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Lagba But usually things, let's say, like dehydration, nothing like stampede usually it's or Usually dehydration, crushing, right? maybe broken hands or people falling down or slipping down or something like that, maybe asthma attacks, but uh, never uh, CPRs or, or, or dead people. So last year we had a guy at around 5 p.m. that fainted and was found that he had no pulse. Uh, we performed CPR and we know he survived. But the whole situation that happened last year in Meron was a different thing to everyone and for everyone. Um, so last year was a thing, was something tragic, big. Uh, so many words you can say about what happened there. Well, I want to hear your experience. So you, you arrived in the morning, and there's no way you could have ever imagined that the next 24 hours would look like what it looked like. Um, where were you standing? Well, well the, the cr everything happened at... Remind me of 12.50, I believe it was. 12.41, 12.42. So where were you when... Okay, so this whole thing uh, happened close to 1 o'clock a.m., okay? I was planning to go home. My shift finished at 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, I was planning to go home. And I stayed around with uh, the medics and the people just, you know, to see everything was going on. And as I was m getting organized to go home, the call came out about... Uh, some balcony that fell down or crushed down. So we said, okay, if it happened, two, three people were injured. And I rushed down there, uh, arriving at scene, finding a, a, a guy gasping, uh, breathing four breaths a minute, understood he needed CPR, and started performing CPR. At that stage, I did not know there were tens of people more crushed next to him, even though they were several meters away from him. And three minutes into performing CPR and giving him shocks and medication and so on and so forth, people said, why are you, why are you performing CPR on this guy? We have a, a mass casualty incident over here. You're not supposed to do CPR because the, the, the theme is when you have a mass casualty incident, you do not perform CPR on people that are not breathing because you most probably have other people that you can, uh, can help and they will There's survive. There's a protocol of priorities. Exactly. And I stopped and I looked up and I moved for two like two meters away and then found the real tragedy of Meron. Uh, tens of people uh, injured, crushed, not breathing, and medics performing CPR uh, on all these people. As this was happening, uh, still pulling out people out of the mixed mesh of people, one on top of the other uh, at this place. So... I automatically uh, put on myself two hats, supposedly. One is uh, the highest medical uh, uh, person on scene and explain to the dispatch what's going on. And the second uh, aspect was to decide on who have to do CPR and who not, what to treat each, peop each person that was there. Um, 
and my brain as this was going on was saying to myself it doesn't make sense something here doesn't make sense you see you see people that they're not breathing but they're not uh injured okay uh they were crushed they were not injured and it's something really hard to understand where you, you stand at the scene and which is three meters and three meters and you see 10 15 people uh going through cpr so that's when I arrived at scene within five minutes, that's that's the thing I saw. Uh, an hour later, uh, we discovered there were forty-five people that, or forty-three or forty-four people that were killed, and tens of people were taken to hospital. Um, and on that stage, uh, we had to understand we have lots of our personal, our people uh, going through severe trauma of what they saw and the treatment they did. Uh, we have to understand that this uh, place, Meron, is a uh, celebration every year. People come to have fun. There's music, dancing, and suddenly the whole thing theme changed. And as we were treating people and performing CPR, the music was still going on because it took time for everyone to understand there's a catastrophe going on. Um, so doing CPR so now, with music in the background? Exactly. Um, so an hour later, all the dead people were put in a certain place. It's a, it's, a, it's a scene you see, but you don't understand what you're seeing. Um, and then we have to treat our people. So I don't want to get there. We're going to get back to that soon. Um, I want to just understand, is your position as a paramedic, does that mean that you were delegating and having to pronounce people dead? Yes. I felt afterwards like uh, Satan or, or something to do with God saying who's to, to live and who's to die um, but that's what the paramedic is supposed to do have you ever been in a position like that before um, yes of course but on one person where you know you've done CPR for 20 minutes 30 minutes you gave medication and so on and so forth but here was because it was mass casualty incident it's an MCI and you have protocols and you know that these people will not survive even though you have people performing CPR um, it's not easy it's a very hard decision to take. I took more than the usual time I usually take in order to pronounce death. Um, no, it wasn't easy at all. And we're going to talk about um, the effects of the medics afterwards. I'd like to turn to Kalani, if you could tell us where you were. First of all, thank you, Avi. I know it's really, really difficult to talk about. Um, Kalani, where were you when you heard what happened, and how did you get to the scene? And you can tell us what happened afterwards. So I was in the ambulance with the driver we had just dropped off our medic who was also riding with us to go home and we were coming up to the command center for where the ambulance are and we hear on the um on the radio the dispatch that a building collapsed and as we're like driving up to the command center we see four or five ambulances turn left to go up to Meron with their sirens on we're like okay those ambulances went up, were not needed, and we continued driving to the command center. And when we get there, um, Ellie Pollack, who is, I think, the president, CEO, the CEO says, says to the driver, what are you doing here? There's a mass casualty. You need to go. And he goes, but the other ambulances went up already. He goes, no, we're, everyone's needed. And just the entire back of the ambulance filled with EMTs, and we drove up the hill tour, towards... Um, towards where the grave is for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And at one point, there were so many people, the ambulance couldn't drive forward anymore. And I just remember Eli Pollack and Laser Hyman. In charge of all the volunteers. Basically just jumped off of the ambulance and started pushing people to the side so that um, we could continue driving up the hill. We got to the top of the hill, and I still remember the driver says to me, like a uh, phrase, he goes, find me someone injured and bring them back to the ambulance. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't seem like a very hard thing to do, find someone injured and bring to the ambulance. And as we've been driving up the hill, we hear that there's one CPR ongoing, and we hear then we hear two CPRs ongoing, and then five CPRs ongoing. We're like, seriously, five CPRs? Aren't they a bit exaggerating? But we were sent to the scene, so we went to the scene. When we got to the top of the hill, we took out the backboard and the straps and the ba medical bag. And four of us grab the backboard and we start running down the hill. Now, the whole place is extremely crowded, but we had no difficulty knowing where to go 
because people were just like moving to the side and yelling us that way, that way, that way. And we just run down the hill. And as we're running down the hill, I see one stretcher coming up the hill performing CPR on it and another stretcher coming up the hill and they're performing CPR on the person and another stretcher. And I'm like, wait a second, we've already had five stretchers pass us coming up the hill and they said there are five ongoing CPRs and we're not even at the scene, scene yet. yet. <laughs> and um, when we get to like the bottom of the hill, and one thing I remember that still sticks with me to this day, there was this one Haredi guy who was standing in the middle of the pathway. And like when I first saw him, I'm like, there's a mass casualty incident, get out of the way. And he's just yelling, I'm standing on a pole, I'm standing on a pole, I'm standing on a pole. Basically there was like a pole in the middle of the sidewalk so that cars wouldn't drive through and him standing on top of the pole like prevented like the EMTs that were running down the hill from like hitting the pole and being injured. And it just like, for me that's stuck in like, everyone tried to help in the little things they could. Like even someone who wasn't a medic, wasn't trained, just was standing on the pole and that prevented us from like running into the pole as we're running down the hill. And as we get to this like stone pathway and it's just like a line of like stretchers and backboards and it, it felt like, I don't know how to tell, like like a lunch line in school. Like you're waiting to get your like food from the cafeteria lady, but instead of waiting to get our food, like we were waiting online to, to like get our body from the pile. And it's just like, it doesn't seem like something you can comprehend until it happens. And then we put our body, we, we get a body from the pile and we put them on the backboard and like we just, fo we're just following like the stream of people. The person in front of us went with this way, the person behind us went that way. And we just followed, and then there was this clearing area, and I, in my head, I call it um, the, like, the CPR clearing, because like everywhere I looked, I only saw other groups of people performing CPR, and we're doing CPR on this guy. And one of the things that's going through my head at the time is that like we had been to so many different, like as part of the EMT trainings, we do mass casualty trainings, and one of the things they always tell us is if when there are CPRs and there are injured people, you treat the injured people first. I didn't see anyone injured. I didn't see a single broken blo bone. I didn't see any blood. All I saw were CPR. So it's like, okay, but there's like, yeah, you're not supposed to start CPR because you're supposed to treat the injured, but like, where are the injured people? It's like, I'm like, thinking about like, where are the injured people? I'm not seeing them anywhere. And I don't remember how long I did CPR on this guy. I'm doing compressions. And I remember at one point a paramedic comes up to me and, and says to me, I'm with him, move on. So I just move over to like the next body or person that they're doing CPR on and I said to the guy, do you want me to replace you? And he goes, yes, and I start compressions. And then I remember like 30 seconds later, the paramedic comes up to me and says, the previous guy is X, I'm with him, move on. And I move to the next person. And I X meaning? X as in declare dead. And I move to the next person and I just like after felt like 30 seconds, a paramedic comes to me, the previous one is X. I'm with him, move on. The previous one is X, I'm with him, move on. Like I never imagined that I could ever be in a situation that I'm doing chest compressions on like over 10 people in a time period of what felt like five minutes. It's like, it doesn't seem comprehensible. If someone had told me that such a situation could ever exist, it would seem impossible, but th that's the reality of what happened. I'm just going, uh, like I mentioned, I'm a pretty strong person, so I was keeping like taking over from these people who had sweat pouring down their faces because they'd been doing compressions for I don't know how long. So I just took over from them, and I'm just like one person to another person. And it's like I do chest compression on this person within like 30 seconds, they're declared dead. Next person, next person, next person, and then like suddenly I'm at the end of the line, and there's like nobody left, and everybody was declared dead and the paramedics, okay, now everybody take the stretchers and let's start moving the bodies in a line. And we're taking the, the bodies that were like, one line was not enough, there are two lines of bodies. And I just remember that like, there was a whole wall of like stretchers, like all the used stretchers, all the used backboards were just against the wall. And you realize that not just are there like, you see the bodies there, but you just see all the backboards, like these were all used to treat patients and they're like not needed anymore. And at that point, we wanted to cover the bodies. And um, the thermal, like I carry in my vest one thermal blanket. So I used it to cover a body. And like everybody started asking everyone, do you have a thermal blanket? Do you have a thermal blanket? Like, and there weren't enough to cover the bodies. And there were just so many. I remember I walked up the hill at that point 
to the logistics center and I took a, a large package of thermal blankets and I came back down the hill and within like seconds they're like people just grabbed them out of my hand and like I had nothing left in my hand and then later on someone from the logistics center do you have any thermal blankets to return to me I'm like nope I don't have any they were all like used it was used. just it was just like I've never like had a pile of equipment like so quickly just everything grabbed out of my hand and used within seconds and it's just like it's just like so many I can't even uh, my brain right it's hard to wrap your head around it you cannot and I still can it's a year later I still can't wrap my head around it Uh, just for some context I'm trying to get some numbers here I don't know how much statistics or data we have but um do we know how many people were in my at the time of the incident that you know tens Tens of of thousands even and how many medics from United I can't say for other organizations but for United at Salah we had uh we we checked and we had around 150 uh, medical personnel of United at Sala at scene because it was just as the we were changing changing of the guards, and also people that were there came with the families, not as medics specifically for for Meron. They came with their families to go up to celebrate, and so we had about 150 people and around 50 people from logistics. So it's 200 people of United at Sala up at the the same and time. And how from beginning of of it's declared as an MCI until everyone just stopped because there was nothing left to do. What was that time period? Uh, it took around between half an hour to an hour, okay, to understand there's no more people uh, needing help and that all the people that needed help, needed help were taken to hospital. I think it was between 30 minutes to 45 minutes So altogether. who were those people? You mentioned that before. These people that were injured, not in the regular sense injured, but... What were their issues that they needed to go to the hospital if they weren't declared dead right away? Uh, broken hands, legs, uh, uh, breathing problems because they were crushed, uh, and things like that. I don't. There's really. This is such a. <laughs> you know. You can't even talk about it in a in without it being mixed up with emotion. I think that so many of the medics I've sat with and they've shared so many difficult things with me, and I've been with Atala now like you know seven years, and I see how the strength that all these medics have. But it sounded to me that this um, broke even the strongest, or let's put it this way, that for finally, a lot of the medics who normally know how to handle um, difficult situations, this was this was the time where they could not. So let's shift this conversation. Avi, maybe you could tell us, obviously, there's stages, right, especially from the side of psychotrauma, there's shock. Um, you have 150 to 200 medics that witness something that no one should ever witness. So when did you transition to, oh, now our medics need help? Okay, so as, as uh, the MCI was going on, we had psychotrauma people at scene already, and they started treat, treating people that saw the thing, nothing to do with United that side, just people that were there. Um, and when we understood our people needed help, uh, uh, as we, now as, as this thing uh, finished, like quarter, quarter to 2 a.m., we, we gathered all our people from all around to one place uh, where we had our headquarters. And we had everyone over there and uh, Eli Polak, okay, uh, stood and spoke. And Dovi Meisel stood and spoke and said, we're going through a horrific situation now. We're here, we're a big family. And as this was going on, we had uh, small groups of psychotrauma uh, people with our medics. Uh, starting to give treatment on the other side in people that weren't on up on on the mountain from a psychotrauma unit started organizing uh, people to speak to our medics as they were going home 7 a.m. Uh, p- uh, all through the night and at 7 a.m. Uh, people were going home we had uh, our supervisor paramedics uh, our psychotrauma people calling these people on the way home and just before Shabbos to see they were doing okay because we knew people, the strongest, the people that have seen things I've been seen. I've se- I'm at. I'm a medic for thirty years already. I've seen stuff, but this was different. So we had everyone uh, have uh, a talk with psychotrauma pr- uh, professionals, and uh, the Motzei Shabbos two days after this is incident and on Sunday, we had uh, group sessions. Uh, asking everyone to come, all the people from United Atala and uh, medical personnel from other groups and even police people that were there 
to come and sit with us and we had big uh, uh, rounds of uh, uh, chats and we had this our professionals keeping on uh, contact with our medics a week later uh, they say uh, to have post-trauma stress disorder usually is about a month after uh, something like that so we had uh, psychotrauma speaking to people uh, red flags for some people that we saw that were still stuck and not uh, keeping on with their lives. Lots of people, a day, two, a week after, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't go to work. Um, and I can say that a year later, as we're, get, we're getting up now to, uh, to Meron, we're doing several things uh, uh, in order to uh, have our people resilient for the next, uh, next stage, meaning Meron this year. Even if they do go up to, uh, to the mountain, if not, uh, we're planning to speak to them and send something and uh, maybe write something to everyone, all the medics, spe- but specifically to the people that were up uh, over there uh, to see how they're doing and to help them go through this year because it's a, tr- a tragic scene they've seen a year ago. And spe- spe- especially people that are planning to go up to the mountain this year, uh, after the, they were there last year, it most probably will bring up lots of emotions and thoughts so we're going to be there, whatever happens. Do you think it's uh, important for specifically those medics to return, kind of like getting back on the horse? La it's, a good, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know the, the correct answer for this. Uh, I think for some people, it's good to go back and see uh, that everything is okay. And for some people, it may bring up uh, lots of emotions that are not for sure. N- not, we're not sure they're ready to, for these uh, emotions to come up and and... So it's a good question. Avi, you're a tough guy. and I I'm not. <laughs> I cried. I, I didn't sleep for several talk. days. It's fine. <laughs> we want to hear yeah. about that because I've only seen you on the side. I mean, I could tell you that the, I could point to the one point with um, Ukraine mission. You were in Ukraine for how long were you in Moldova? Two weeks. Two weeks like leading the mission practically. And the time that I cried most... The, th- the piece of media that hit me the hardest was when, I won't say who it was, but when you were crying, one of um, our head medics in Ukraine who had just came off a long ambulance shift and he was m- really breaking down and you stood there taking care of him and his tears with your compassion, it hit me stronger than almost anything else. So I was going to say, so you're a strong guy, but I do believe, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your process over the last year? So as... as as the situation was going on, and when I went to call all the medics from all around the, the mountain, I found people screaming, crying, people with a blank uh, mimic on the face. And at some stage, I was on my own. And I started crying. I was like, okay, this is not the time to cry. Okay, you're in charge. People are looking at you. You're a paramedic, and you have a big role over here. So I stopped. Okay, but I was like, things didn't add up. I stayed on the mountain. I was supposed to go home 12 o'clock, like 15 minutes before, th- 40 minutes before this happened. Uh, I stayed until about 9, 10 o'clock. Once I made sure all of our medics have how to get home. Uh, and I spoke to them through, uh, through the night. How are you doing? To see who's... And as I was driving home, the same thing. I explained to my wife, didn't, my wife didn't even know things were going on. She was asleep. The WhatsApp family, we, we have a, a family WhatsApp. My sister and my brother asked if, if I'm okay because they, they knew something was on. And she found out like 7 o'clock in the morning something was going on. I didn't think about even calling her, but she didn't know about anything. But on the way home, I was on the phone uh, with psychotrauma to make sure everyone gets a call. And with who not, and on radio, on television, from all around the world and in Israel. And I tried to sleep before Shabbos. I couldn't sleep. And I went to shore. And people asked me, how are you doing? And I told them the story without emotions. It was like, because I didn't understand what was going on. On the Motsi Shabbos, when we came here for the, the group uh, sessions, uh, we sat people from, you know, uh, only from the, from the office, okay? We sat with all the medics in the beginning, and then we had only the people from the office, people in charge. And then I broke down. I started crying. I said, why? And I wrote something on Facebook, and the theme was, why me? I did not ask for this. Why Why did I have, to, I have to be like the Satan or the side? Why me? But then I understood there's most probably a reason from upward why it was me. 
and I know that most of our medics and paramedics that we had seen had me over there and it gave them a real option to feel safe at the scene because they know me, because they know who I am, because I'm at the medical department. So seeing me over there at scene gave them lots of peace of peace of mind and gave them what they needed to maybe to go through and had lots of connections after Meron with lots of medics and until today people ask me why did you do this why did you decide that and what I did is put some sense into the medical side not why it happened but why we did what we did and that itself helped lots of people lots of our medics and medics from other groups to go through this trauma easier okay understanding the the medical side uh, of what was going on it wasn't easy I don't think about it I've been up to Mount three times again I didn't feel any emotions about it because from my side I close the story but I am dealing a lot with our medics helping them close the story mm-hmm. so so you didn't have any severe post-trauma episodes or no I've seen too many things in my life so <laughs> okay <laughs> so that's yeah, a lot, sorry. That's a lot yeah. to take in. Um, exactly. I would ask you more questions, but I'm going to move this to Kalani. If you could tell us, um, you know, it was. I'll, I'll just share what happened, me and you. So it was Friday. Was it the next day, Friday, that I saw you in the supermarket? After Milan? I, I don't remember I don't either. Remember I don't remember, remember if it was Friday or maybe it was the following <laughs> Sunday. And my husband was wearing my uh, my extra, extra large Hatsala jacket that is way too big on me. Oh, a hat. A hat. Okay, he was wearing fine. A hat. I knew it was one or the other. He was wearing a Hatsala hat. <laughs> he was wearing a Hatsala hat. And we were shopping. And we both live in the same area. And Kalani, you came up to my husband and said, are you a medic? And I don't think I said you're a medic. I said, you're from Hatsala also, right? Something like and he just like gives me this look like, who's this? <laughs> and I remember store. this is the first time I met you. I had known your name, but I had never met you. And like you were a wreck. <laughs> you were you just kind of like we're talking like, yeah, I was there. It was my road. And this happened. That happened. I was talking about it to and every single person. You looked person. like you were in a state of shock. And so I could only imagine if that was Sunday. What did, you know, that th- late Thursday night, Friday Shabbos look like for you? And, and the next few and months. Shabbos was actually what I like to call robot mode. I find that when I'm ever in a difficult situation, I just do not have emotions. Emotions do not exist. They get put on the back burner. And now I'm functioning and like I'll deal with my emotions later. And um, that's pretty much what happened to me in Meron. Like I'm on robot mode. Like, cause if I, if I pause to think about how I'm feeling, <laughs> I would completely not, not be functional. And I didn't have the time to not function. Like uh, when Avi called every, all the EMTs to the tent, I showed up at the tent and like about a minute after I had just walked in the entrance, a guy comes in and he says, we need the psychotrauma unit, we need the psychotrauma unit. Now all the um, the more uh, se- senior um, psychotrauma unit members were like on scene to deal with the EMTs that were having difficulty. And Uriel Balmas um, looks at me and goes, you're now Chosen, like you're now psychotrauma. Like I had finished the course, I had never responded to a psychotrauma call in my life. And I like to call it uh, my trial by fire because I went from having responded to zero psychotrauma calls in my life. I'd gone through scenarios and practiced it, but I'd never actually treated someone on the scene to treating over 100 people. Like for the next four hours, maybe even more, I just walked around the the scene of my own and I just literally walked up to every person I saw. I say, hi, my name is Kalanid. I'm an EMT with United at Salah. Do you need help with anything? And sometimes people say, no, we're fine. And then I'd go up to the next person, ask them the same thing, and they would just be like this blank stare on their face, and they're completely unresponsive. So I said, um, I said, is there anything I can help you with? And like, I would try asking them a different co- couple questions, and they were frozen in place. They were completely catatonic. And what I did is I did something we learned in the course. I, I walked up to them, and I said, I held their hand, and I said, I'm with you right now. I'm here with you. I'm going to like count to three and squeeze your hand. And when you're ready, you're going to squeeze my hand back. And I went through that with them. And one of the things that made Meron so difficult is one of the things we're taught in the, as part of the psychotrauma unit is give the patient something to do. Like if I'm at a CPR and the, a woman's husband had just passed away, I'll ask her, can you get me your husband's to that zahut? That gives the patient something to do. In Meron, 
it was very difficult to give the patient something to do because here you have a woman who is hysterical and she's extremely worried about her husband. She can't go looking for him. The com- place is a complete and total mess. She ca- I can't even tell her to try calling her husband because the phone lines were down or checking her Facebook or her husband's Facebook. Maybe her husband posted and declared, and said, nope, the internet wasn't working. Maybe she should start heading home. Nope, there were no buses to leaving at the time. Like, to give them something concrete to do, there was almost like nothing to give them to do. So what I ended up doing is I told them, like, like I had started by holding their hand and squeezing the hand. I'm like, I want you to try squeezing your own hand. And every time you feel panic, start to panic, just calmly count to three and squeeze your own hand. And like that was the only thing mo- in most of the situations that I could give them to do because all the other normal things I'd give someone to do in a psychotrauma situation were not an option. And... Um, I just was walking around for hours, and one of the things I remember quite clearly as I walked into his tent, and it was one of the um, Hatsala clinics. It was like, it was the women's clinic at Meron, and there were like three beds there, and each bed had like four women sitting on it, and a couple women in chairs, all completely hysterical. And I just went from one woman to another woman, like 15 women in a row, like one after another, after another, helping to calm them down. Like normally when you're treating and like you're with other people helping you and I was just by myself there and just went through all the women in the, uh, in the tent one at a time. And one of the things I remember is like at about 6 a.m. one of those women came up to me and goes, thank you so much, you helped me so much. Like, cause I was so like, I didn't know what to do. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. Because like I had, I had by that point treated so, so many people. And she goes, I was one of the women in the tent. I'm like, oh, okay, because like, there were a lot of women in the tent. And the other psychotrauma call that I remember so much is at the entrance to Meron, there's this flat traffic circle, and all the buses were driving across. And there was this one guy, as he's crossing the traffic circle, he just couldn't take it anymore, and he just lay down on the ground in fetal position. Like, he just was too overwhelmed by everything he saw. Now, all the buses are blocked because he's lying in the middle of the street. So I sat down next to him, and I held his hand. I said, I'm here with you. Do you want to go on the side to talk? And, like, the entire time, the police officer was like, get him out of the street, get him out of the street. I'm like, wait a second. Give me two minutes to work with this guy. So I sat with him, and I talked with him. And in the end, he agreed to get up. Like, that was something when I had something to do. Like, can you help me by sitting up on a bench, and we can sit and talk? And we moved to the bench, and we sat in the talk. And it, but just... People talk about Merona, there was a mass casualty incident from a CPR and a medical treating injuries point of view, and that's true, and I 100% agree with that. But I think people forget that it was also a mass casualty incident from a psychotrauma perspective because there were so many people in shock, women who saw a stretcher passing by performing CPR, someone, a kid who couldn't find his father, a mother who couldn't find their daughter, anyone who couldn't find a family member or a friend, just everywhere you went, you just saw one person after another person after another person. What's really interesting is that when I asked Avi and when I asked you, you both dodged the question. (laughs) You go around, because it's, I said, how did you deal with it? And everything you just said, right, by functioning. functioning. But what's so interesting to me is that it's like the psyche of a medic. Right away, it goes but into... But no, it's not just the psyche of a medic. Remember I said one of the things you do action. to help someone is give them something to do. So how did I deal with it? By doing. What about I, weeks and months sit down, and a year later? So, Okay, so <laughs> that, that is after. That I dealt with it in other ways. But like at the time, you're in the middle of... You just saw something horrific, which will hopefully be the most horrific thing I'll see in my life. And I'll never, ever see something like that again. But the, the way you deal with it is by doing, because you either have the choice of breaking down and being complete hysteria because what you just saw was just that horrific beyond anything you could have ever imagined in your life, or helping other people and like channeling that emotion t- into like helping others or, or, or talking with them. Did but, psychotrauma um, call you at some point and you oh got yes. the help that you needed? <laughs> a number of times because I, I had a lot of difficulty afterwards I um one of the things that my fellow EMTs where I lived did that was extremely helpful is they arranged like everything all the food for Shabbos like I'm like okay I'm supposed to finish my shift around 1 a.m 
or maybe even about 4 a.m. I'll get home at about 3 or 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. I'll cook for Shabbos quickly. Nope, they made everything for me. And uh, one person said, do you have any requests? I'm like, could you make a cake? Because it's my daughter's ninth birthday. And she said, don't worry. And, like, and I thought like she'd make me like, a, I don't know, a brownies or something like that. She makes me like this cake in the shape of a nine with like wow. marshmallow flowers on it. It was like awesome. And like my daughter, she totally didn't think about the fact that her mother was in like a complete state of shock on her birthday. Instead, she was thinking about, I got <laughs> such an awesome <laughs> birthday cake. <laughs> so like it didn't like translate to her like how I was dealing with everything. But one of the things... Um, like in terms of how I dealt with it is like for a while I was in what I call my like robot mode and I was just functioning like if you asked me how I felt at a certain point in time my answer would be I don't have any emotional memories of that point in time. You told me it took months to even recall the faces of the people you did yeah, CPR so on. <laughs> yeah that about a month plus um, but um, but about a week after Meron um, I responded to a call to a woman who had fallen in the bathroom. It was my first call that I was responding to as an EMT afterwards. Uh, I think it was Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, and I get there, and I functioned wonderfully as an EMT, like I always do. Like I said, I go into my robot mode. And when I left the house, I, I just started crying. And like n not in the house, like when I got back to my car. And there was another EMT with me, and he's like, Kalnit, wait a second, I'm going to make some phone calls. I think about five or ten minutes later, I get a phone call for the head of my from the head of my division from where I live. And he goes like, Kalnit, you have an appointment for a trauma therapist in an hour. And I don't think people understand how amazing and how much it shows that Hatsala cares about its EMT. Like, I'm having difficulty after... A mass casualty, and they arranged for an appointment for me to see a trauma therapist. I in can't an hour. think of one other organization <laughs> that would do something. I would hope <laughs> other places do that, but it's, it's like it really unique. shows how unique and how special that they really go We're above and beyond to help out. The, definitely, wow. definitely to help their EMTs, and the trauma therapist definitely helped me a lot. Um, I continued seeing a. I think it was a, s a clinical social worker about two or three times a week for about a month wow. afterwards because it was it was extremely difficult, was extremely difficult <laughs> to process. But like what you said about the, um, the remembering the faces, I couldn't remember the face of anyone I did CPR me with. By the way, <laughs> people ask me if I did CPR on the family. You don't know. I have no vision of anyone. You can't match it to the picture. So, well, that's the interesting thing is like, I couldn't remember the faces at all whatsoever. And I'm like, I should remember the guy that I got from the pile and I was doing CPR on him for like five plus minutes. And I'm like, I can't remember his face. And it was about a month after um, the tragedy, Hatsala had a gathering of all the EMTs at the scene. And one of the things they had, they had these big poster boards of the pictures of everybody there. And I just remember I kept looking at this one guy's Everybody picture. that passed away, you mean? Everyone that passed away. Yeah. And I kept looking at those one guy's pictures, and I'm like, Kalnit, you're just playing tricks on your mind because his picture is the clearest picture there. It was, a, it was a very, very clear, like a lot of these pictures, by the, when they blew them up they big, they were blurry. His picture was not blurry. And I'm like, that's why you're focusing on his face because it's blurry. But like his picture was like completely on the other side of the stage from where I was sitting. And one of the things I was looking for when we went up there is I was looking for the other EMT who was with me at the scene, and he wasn't there that <laughs> evening, and that was very hard for me. I actually broke down crying when I couldn't find oh. him. And, but there was a video taken of me as I was running to the scene, and I took a s still shot of that video, and I started showing that picture to everyone. So I said, oh, I know who he is. I called him up the next day. So like we'd, I think we went up there on a... Uh, I don't even remember what day of the week it was. But the next day I called him up and he told me the name of the guy I had done CPR on. It was that th man. That we had received. And it was that same guy that I had been looking at his picture. Now, if I try to imagine the scene about who I was doing CPR on, I don't remember his face at all. But it just like, it, it like clicked for me that like the guy that I kept staring at his picture ended up being the guy that I had been doing CPR on, even though I couldn't remember it at all. And I think what, like, the therapy sessions were extremely, extremely important. But I think what for me was like, I guess you could say the final straw to help me like 
return back to like functioning normally is it bothered me that I wasn't remembering them as people. I was remembering them as bodies. And I'm like, I wasn't doing CPR on bodies, which I was, but like I was doing CPR on real people. And I ended up um, through another EMT and Atala contacting the mother because I first made sure that she was willing to talk with me. And I'm like, can you please just tell me about your son? Tell me what he was like. Tell me what he was like as a person, what he was like as a kid. And I spent a good hour wow. talking to him and it really made a difference to me that I knew him a child like I knew about him no he wasn't a child he was I think he was 20 years old but I like most of his life that his mother knew about was as like a child in teenage room but I had memories of him from like what his mother told me as a person and that for me was like like it is like suddenly I'm not just thinking about bodies I'm thinking about people and that just like helped me out from a memory I'll tell you two quick things I mean we have to wrap up even though we can go on and on um but I, you know, it was very interesting because I've been through also, like I thought that I had been through a lot of MCIs and, and difficult situations being part of Atala. Um, but clearly nothing was close to this. But I was actually on maternity leave at the time and I was sleeping. And I think I woke up at like three in the morning to, um, to nurse my baby and my husband was in my own. And I see what's going on. And wow. I had turned wow. off wow. my husband. I had turned off my work phone during maternity leave. So, and I, for some reason, I was like, I have to turn my phone on. And my phone was blowing up. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And, and I, I was up the entire night just, I don't even remember what was going through my but Did you manage to get hold of your husband? Yes. It took a few hours. It took a few hours. And he came back. He got home 20 minutes before Shabbos. Um, it was real. He suffered tremendously. Um, Actually, he hadn't seen anything. He wasn't even like close to the area, but just being in the scene was enough. Um, but I'll tell you what was really fascinating for me is that I, c- I don't want to say who it is just for privacy purposes, but there's someone in the organization who is a medic and um, a very, let's say, like on the outside tough kind of guy, but I'm very close with his mother. And his mother, a li- like a few weeks later, told me like that Friday night, he was acting totally normal at the Shabbos table. And she kept saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And then Pitom, right, suddenly he was completely not okay. And she called for backup help. And on Friday night, some guy left Shul, came running, and sat with him for, like, almost the entire night. Um, And they ended up helping him, and he went on a trip, and they really, really did a lot for him. Um, And I'll tell you something else that really both of you mentioned, and I think this is so unique, and we don't, as as someone who's not a medic, I don't really understand this. But I remember hearing um, Avigail Beer, who was very open and and was talking about her experiences at the time. She kept talking about what you said, both of you, like there was nothing to, there was no injury. There was nothing to see. It was just five seconds ago, this person looked the exact same, but was alive and now they're dead. And that like is a psychological, I don't even know what the word is. How, you know, like how do you even cope with understanding that like, oh, breath is what keeps us alive. And you take that little, that quote unquote little thing away and you and realize it's not so little. Being buried, exactly. So I can't even imagine the catastrophe. I want to ask one more question um, about organization because when we think of Mayron from the outside, it sounds like just pure chaos. But both of you describe things as semi-organized. Did you feel that there was there was structure in the sense? Obviously, there was no structure, you know, because it was chaos. But it was a structure within the chaos. Yeah, like because because of the drills that you do and because of the preparation you've had, because there's protocol in place. Do you feel that? everyone kind of like knew their role and what they were needed to do next? It's a good question and uh, I want to answer in two aspects. Each MCI is different and no matter how much you train in advance, it's always the next one will be different than the other one and Miron will, is a different thing because the MCI was going on as we arrived. Usually when you have a mass casualty incident, the incident happened and you arrived after it's finished. Miron was different. People were still coming out. That's one aspect. So no, there was no organization. Nothing was organized. It was, uh, as we call it in Hebrew, a big balagan because it was a very small place where things were going on and lots and lots of people trying to help. And it's not as if you have like, a, I don't know, let's say a football place where you have dozens of uh, meters to work on. Here, everything was squished into a very small uh, place. So that's one aspect. The second aspect 
we decided based on Meron to train all of our medics in 2022 this year on everything to do with MCIs. So we have our medics doing four hours on the computer learning on MCI and then they'll have required. also required and four more hours of training, okay? Based on a, a film we just videoed this week, uh, uh, an MCI film to teach them what the, what the role of is each person in, the dr in uh, an MCI to maybe organize the chaos in the chaos that's always there whatever happens. Uh, and another thing I want to add about psychotrauma, about uh, United Atsala, none of the other groups, if it's police or other medical groups, do not have psychotrauma. So the, the sense of family or what you explained, Kalanita, about what you went for, even what you went for when people called you or spoke to you, made food for you or, or anything else, or this guy that came out of short to help his friend, other groups don't have it. And that's something very unique of an Adi Datsala. And we're teaching psychotrauma now. Psychotrauma now. We had a plan during Corona to teach in England. And we taught now in Jersey. And we just had a pro someone approaching from Australia. From Hatsala in Australia to, to learn how to do psychotrauma. Uh, and so we're doing something good. And we did something good out of all the chaos uh, that was up in Meron. We managed to save the people we could. Uh, we managed to help psychotrauma, our medics and people at scene. Miro was a tragedy. There, there's no other word. I don't know how to end this, but I will say that for any listeners, um, if there's, you just talked about an action, right? Like to give someone an action. It could be from a religious point of view. It could be from a non-religious point of view. It could be from any point of view. Is there anything that you feel you can give over to our listeners? Like, okay, you just listened to this really heavy, you know, situation and we're all going through the Azkara, the year anniversary now, like is there anything that people could do <laughs> if they wanted to take an action? You're not alone. Just remember like be with someone like hold their hand. Like you're not alone. You're there to help them. Or even just hearing something difficult. Just remember that like within Hatsala, within Jewish Jewish people, within humanity around the world, everybody tries to help each other and being there for another person and telling them you're not alone is a huge, huge thing that makes a big difference. Avi, any last parting words? Um, it's a good question. I do, know, I do not know what to answer about this question. If you can do any preparations for, for Meron or for people that are going up there or people, even people that are not, not, out, not medical, people that were there, as you said, let's say your husband. I don't know if there's any preparation. I can tell you one of the things I did. You asked before. You said we went around and didn't answer the question. What I did when I went back a few months ago with a friend that, that was, she's not from United Atsala. She's from a different medical group. She hadn't been sleeping for six months, okay, because of hearing the screaming of the people and the kids and so on and so forth. And I took her up to Meron. I, I told that she has to come with me to Meron. And we went to where the, the thing, this thing happened, and I told her to say to Helen for the people that were killed, and she says, okay. And then I told her to say she's sorry. And she asked why I did what I did. I said, you have to say sorry for all those nishamas that were, were taken away. And that's what helped her start sleeping at night when she felt she cleared her 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 anything she, she cleared everything out so each one has a different story about Meron from the people that were there if it's your husband or someone else if it's medical if it's psychotrauma I think everyone should do some tikkun or help something or give daka for the Lulu Nishmat so you know you're doing something for all these people that did not survive and since you did survive okay um, fulfill what they didn't fulfill so maybe that's a, a, a good thing to do to do a mitzvah on that day, Nishmat, and for those people that couldn't uh, keep on. That was a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much. I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm, I'm shocked, and actually. I'm, and I'm not even chasidish, so. Yeah. I'm actually shocked. No, I'm really not. I want to thank you both so much for coming and taking the time out to sit here with me. I know it's not easy, and for sharing your stories with the world. Yeah. And we should just only share joyous occasions and only good things. Bezrat Hashem, please God, and thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening to the United Humans podcast. Share this with a friend, subscribe, and we already know you're going to leave us a positive review. So we'll just thank you now for that. Bye. Adios.